Good day, grade 12s. Welcome to this lesson on physical science. In the last couple of lessons, we've been going through the common papers, the June common papers of physical science, both physics and chemistry. And in this lesson, what we're going to do is I'm going to start off by going through the beginnings of the grade 12 curriculum. Um, I would really like to encourage you to not only just watch the video, but also to by clicking on the links, but also to join the to enable platform and to also to join the physical science grade 12 class. If you do that, then you can message me and then you can answer. Or I, you can ask me some questions or you can tell me sections that you're struggling in, etc. At the moment, what I'm doing is because of the way the system set up, I'm going to be highlighting sections that I think are very important. So the first section I'm going through is probably one that you guys think is the least important. It's skills for scientific investigation. Now there's two reasons I'm going through this section. One is because you have to do practicals in grade 12 and grade 11 and grade 10 and or experiments and some of you may have completed all your practicals already and that is wonderful and some of you may not have and it counts a huge part of your CAS which is your continuous assessment um, so it is good to be able to use the skills but more importantly in your final exams in either the physics paper or the chemistry paper or sometimes if you're lucky they in both papers there is a question that is dependent on using your skills okay so we're going to go through what you need to know in order to do a scientific investigation so first of all you need to know the difference between the hypothesis and an aim a hypothesis is an educated guess as to what will happen and you need to relate to variables so you can't just go oh i think it's going to get hot okay you need to relate to variables like you need to say that an increase did you think that possibly an increase in the number of particles might result in an increase in temperature it has to relate to variables it doesn't have to be right you could be totally and totally incorrect as long as you are comparing the right to variables okay so if you're talking about plants being watered as or the amount of water relating to the amount of growth of a plant you could say for example that I think that the plant that gets the most amount of water is going to grow the least. That's fine. What are you doing? You're relating the amount of water to the growth. Okay. And that is all you need to do with an hypothesis. And you need to give an educated guess of what you think you're giving a suggestion of what you think the outcome of the experiment is going to be. An aim is what we are going to investigate. Okay, so in this case, it would be I'm going to investigate the growth of a plant. That's it. End of story. If there are two types of data that the aim is going to refer to, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But your aim just tells me what I'm going to investigate. There's no guessing. There's no suggestion of what the answer will be, but you can have an incorrect aim. If your aim is to discover how tall the trees are going to grow and you write that your aim is to see how many leaves the trees produce and that will be wrong. So you need to be very careful of that. Now there are two types of data which we use when we are talking about aims and when we are measuring things and one is quantitative and the other is qualitative and we're now going to discuss the two types of data and again they love asking these types of questions in the exams amazingly or not um they like to ask you what types of data it is they might ask you to to, to state what data is being used, etc., etc. What I've done in this lesson is I have specifically gone through, we're going to be going through this, and then I've come up with a theoretical question, a very silly question, but it helps you identify the type of questions they might ask in the exams. So quantitative data is data that can be measured. In other words, how long something is, how big the area is, the volume, the time and speed. So quantitative is how much you can actually measure it with a ruler or with a um, cylinder or something like that. Okay. Whereas qualitative data cannot be measured. 
So it gives us an indication. So it's either changes in color or production of smell. So for example, if you're doing titrations and you're looking at the changing color, then you can see that this here is just a basic standard universal indicator. But have a look at this. If I'm looking at, for example, this ammonium solution. Now, if I look at that color, and if you look at that color, we might describe it as something slightly different because everybody views colors slightly differently to each other, okay? Um, the reason for this is because our eyes pick up the energy from the color at different frequencies. It's not really important, but it's true that we all have slightly different impressions of colors, okay? So I might say to you, well, that actually is a very bright pink, and you might go, no, it's more like a dusky pink, okay? The point is that it's a qualitative data, okay? We both might agree it's pink, okay? We might not if one of us is colorblind, and that's also an issue. But that's beside the point. The point is that qualitative data cannot be measured. You can't say it's definitely a pH of 11. You're saying that it's kind of around about maybe a pink that might be between, for example, 12 and 10 and a half, okay? And the sand or the production of smell. Now, I don't personally don't have a very good sense of smell. My father does have a very good sense of smell. So he can smell things from a mile away. Okay, if I'm cooking food and he's down in the garage, he can smell it immediately. Okay, whereas I need to be next to the pot before I can smell if I've added the herbs or not. Okay, so again, that is a bit of a problem because it depends if we're using the production of smell as a de determinate, determining factor as to whether or not something has been produced and you don't have a very good sense of smell, then you're not going to give a very good result. Okay, so qualitative data is kind of a complicated one to go through. Okay, so your variables. Your variables, there are three types of variables. There's dependent, and there's independent and they are fixed. Okay, so we're going to talk first about the dependent variable. Now that is what is measured. So if you're measuring how tall the trees are, we are measuring the length of the trees and that's what's measured. Okay, it's always represented on the Y axis. And if you struggle to remember that, um, remember the straight down equation is Y is equal to MX plus C. Okay, so Basically, what we're saying is that Y depends on X, okay? Y depends on X. So, therefore, it is on the Y axis. The independent variable is the thing that's changed. So, we're going to change the X value to get out a Y value, okay? So, for example, if we again are relating the amount of water to the growth of a plant, X would be the amount of water I've added, and Y would be how tall the plant got. Okay, just a silly example, but do you understand? Okay, so X, Y is dependent on X. So therefore, it's always represented on the X axis. So your dependent variable is always on the Y axis, and the independent variable is always on the X axis. Okay, and and time isn't always the independent variable. You need to just be careful about that, okay? 90% of the time it is, but not always. The third variable we get is a controlled or fixed variable. And these are variables that are kept constant. And the reason we keep them constant is to make sure we have a fair test, okay? They like to say to you, why do you keep the temperature the same? Why? Because we want to ensure a fair test, because the temperature might affect the outcome. So in order to make sure that we are making only, we're measuring only the variables that actually affect the experiment that we are doing, we need to look at the variables and keep the ones that could affect it constant. So it's required to ensure a fair test. Now, when you're doing experiments, you need to look at safety and safety precautions. So typical safety, safety precautions that are needed are safety glasses, gloves, and a fume cupboard. Okay, now they love to ask about safety precautions. But now listen, guys, if you're doing a physical experiment where you're looking at little 
cars rolling down a hill, please don't say fume cupboard, okay? Because obviously you can't, fume cupboard's not even gonna be used in the experiment. Whereas if you are using, doing an experiment where you could have some chemicals either splashing around or giving off fumes, then these are all three very good safety precautions, okay? Now your method. There's observation, data collection, and data handling, okay? So your observation, all of these, the observation, data collection, and data handling needs to be very, very, very accurate. Because the more accurate you are, the more likely you are going to get a correct result out. You need to repeat the experiment, the experiment at least three times. Now, when I was at university and we were doing experiments, we had to repeat them at least, <laughs> more like at least a hundred times. And then what you do is you find the average of your results, okay? Why at least three times? Because let's say, for example, you're measuring, I don't know, the growth rate of a plant. So in this case, what I would do is I would have three plants all of the same kind, all in the same container, all in the same amount of light, okay? Obviously, this is a more biological experiment than anything else. I'm just using it because it's an easy experiment to understand, to visualize, okay? And let's say I wanna see how quickly these plants grow. So ideally, what I would do is I wouldn't put it in the sunlight, I'd put it in a closed room where I would have a growth lamp that I would leave on for a certain number of hours so they had the same amount of light. Okay, and then what I would do is I would put in the same amount of liquid into each of these, these trees and I would see their growth rate. And obviously this would be a long-term thing. We need to go and look at this a couple of times, I mean, for at least a month or so. So the reason you want to repeat the experiment or do multiple examples is because let's say this one grows um, 40 centimeters over the period. This, uh, this one is a little bit stunted and there's something wrong with its roots or whatever. It only grows 10 centimeters, but this dude also grows about 39 centimeters. Do you agree that we could say, well, ah, obviously then this is just bad data because there's something wrong with this and therefore we can say that our plants are going to be growing approximately 40 to 39 centimeters in that period. So obviously you, that's the reason you want to repeat your experiment at least three times. Ideally, if you did an experiment and you got an answer like this out, you would do another experiment to confirm your answer. Because if the next plant or experiment also had about a nine centimeter growth or 10 centimeter growth, then there's something wrong with your experiment. Okay, because then you've got two averages that are way off. But if this plant grew about another 41 centimeters, then you'd say, well, awesome. This year is a data that doesn't fit my graph. This all fits my graph and I can approximate that that is my answer. Okay, typical precautions are needed. The same person needs to be taking all the readings, all the measurings, measuring the time all the time, okay? Why is that? Well, like I said in the previous slide, if you've got quantitative data and you're looking at the color of something being changed, then obviously if you're looking for the titration and you're looking for an indicated color change, if I'm seeing something is being very bright and pink and you might not see the color at all, then obviously I will see the change at a different time to you. So we want to make sure that the same person is taking all the readings so that the same person is measuring the same amount of product that is required to get the color change or measuring the time. If you think about this, it's pretty obvious. You might have a totally different response time to me. If say, for example, you pay a lot of computer games, or whatever, you might have very good um, reaction times, whereas I might not have such good reaction times. So if you're watching a ball drop, then you would have a very good reaction time to pressing the stopwatch when you are measuring when a drop hits the ground, right? Whereas I might not. So if we did it, uh, you did one, if I'm your partner and you do the one experiment and I do the next one and then you do the third one, our results are going to probably be quite different and all because of our reaction time. So it's not to do with our experiment, it's to do with the fact that we're not measuring accurately. So that is one thing that needs to be done. 
You need to be careful when taking your readings. So you have to be careful of things like the meniscus and the error of parallax. So what I'm going to do is just erase this writing here so you can see what I'm talking about. So just a typical example of when you need to be careful when you're taking your readings is the meniscus and the error of parallax. Now, most fluids, or actually all fluids except for mercury, have a meniscus that is concave. And the reason they're concave is because there's forces of cohesion and forces of adhesion. I'm not going to get too much into that. Just that the forces of the particles between, between the surface particles and the actual particles in the liquid are stronger than the forces between the liquid and the side of the glass. So you end up with a little bit of a concave thing here, okay? So now if I'm standing up, and I've got my measuring cylinder and I look down at it, I would read this value here as being the measurement for my fluid. So for example, if I did that, I would say, oh, this has got a volume of 21. Whereas if I get down to the level of the meniscus, okay, there's no error of parallax. That's called the error of parallax. Okay, and I will see, well, actually, that there is the real measurement. So that's 21.1, 2, 3, 4, 5, yeah. So that's 21 comma 1. Okay, so that makes quite a big difference and it might not seem that big a difference at this point in time, but actually when you're talking cubic centimeters and you're talking about points of, end points in titrations, that extra one, 0.1 of a cubic centimeter can make a huge difference. So you need to be careful of that. And that's just one example of where you need to be careful when you're taking your readings. Now your results. These need to be presented in an appropriate manner. So you can either draw tables or graphs. I'm going to state this right now, grade 12s. If you represent your data as a pie chart in physical science, your teacher is going to laugh you out of the class. Okay, we do not do pie charts. The only time you do pie charts is in science is if you're doing a randomized checking if the people in your extra science class want to have pizza or if they want to have donuts, okay? You do not use pie charts in science. We use graphs and we don't use bar graphs and histogra histograms either. We use line graphs, okay? Tables are pretty obvious and we'll talk about tables. The most important thing about the table is that the units must be in the headings of the table. So if you've got a table that you're drawing and obviously you will be drawing your table and I know I said every lesson, you will be using a pencil and a ruler and an eraser. So if you do a table and this year is time, you need to put your unit in the heading that has to be there. If your value here is say, for example, 0, 0,6 seconds, and you are writing this here, like this is 0, 0,8 seconds. If you're putting your units inside your table, your table is going to be marked with negative marking because the units must be in the headings, okay? They cannot be in the actual table. Graphs, you need to draw a best fit line, okay? It has to be a best fit line. Now, what do I mean by best fit line? Okay, so it doesn't have to be a straight line. A couple of years ago, quite a few years ago, in fact, the IAB set an exam where they asked the children to plot the points, okay? And the points went along like this. So this is more or less what the graph looked like. And then the points looked like that. And numerous children decided that they were asked to draw a best fit line. And at the time, a lot of them thought the best fit line had to be a straight line. So they had graphs looking like that, where people were trying to fit the data into a straight line. Great tools, that's not the case. A best fit line can be any shape of line, right? So in other words, it could be a hyperbola, it could be a parabola. The point is that it is the best line that fits the data. So in this case, in fact, I think it was an exponential curve. Okay, so there we go. 
that is where it's line. You don't do that. That is horrible. And that is why you draw your graphs in, wait for it, pencil, and you use an eraser to fix errors like that. Okay, another thing I want to talk to you about graphs quickly is something that a lot of students make the mistake of, especially if they do other subjects that use graphs, because different subjects have different rules with graphs, okay? If you have graph that has, these are the results, okay, these are the results. Right, and I ask you to draw a best fit line. Now, you do not join the dots. You are not a two-year-old. You do not go around joining the dots, okay? That is not a best fit line. What is a best fit line is when we try and get a line that goes through the most dots and follows the trend of the dots. Okay, so let me just fill in the points. So in this case, it is obvious that it's a straight line graph. And in this case, I would say that it has to go through the midpoint of these line points. So I would say it looks more or less like that. And this line has to be drawn with a ruler as well. Okay. And what we're doing is either trying to get the same, the same number of points equidistant on either side of your line, or your line must go through as many points as possible. Okay, so that is a best fit line. Now, with analysis, analysis, you need to identify the trends. So, for example, if this is time and this is mass, in kilograms and this is time in seconds yeah your trend would be that as the time increases the mass of the object increases and it is directly proportional because of the fact that it is a straight line graph so do you see what i mean by an identifying trends now conclusions sources of errors and recommendations now these go hand in hand and if you don't know how to write these properly, either in the examinations or in your practicals, you're going to lose substantial marks. So your conclusion has to be able to use the trends identified to make a conclusion. You need to look at the trend. So in other words, in the last one, we had this graph on this last slide where your mass in kilograms was increasing as the time was increasing. So my conclusion would relate that. I would have to say that I noticed that the mass was directly proportional to the time. Therefore, I can conclude that the increase in water was, or the use of water was important or whatever, okay? But you need to relate the trends identified. Also, and this is very important, you need to relate the variables and it must relate back to the hypothesis. So let's say, for example, your hypothesis was that um, the larger an object, the larger an object, the longer it takes to fall. So my hypothesis is that the bigger the object, the longer it takes to fall. Okay, that's my hypothesis. Now, if I come back to and I write a conclusion, and my conclusion is something along the lines of uh, what could it be? the object entirely different variables. Here I've said the larger the object, the longer it takes to fall. And in my conclusion, I've stated the longer it takes to fall. So i have not having the same variables there. And that is, means that my conclusion is basically a false conclusion because we've not related the correct variables. It has to relate back to the hypothesis. But what is important about both these statements is that I have to relate the variables. I cannot, please, grade 12, you cannot write in a conclusion, I was right, or my hypothesis was right. You have to actually say it. You have to go, 
the I'm the conclusion is that the larger the object, well, actually that's not true. The higher the object, the longer it takes to fall. You have to actually state it. Okay. Now, sources of error. One needs to be aware of potential sources of error that may have affected the outcome of the experiment. And that can be something to do with the fact that the different people measured the time it took for the object to fall, and therefore there was a the experimental error. Okay, or it could have been that there were errors of parallax with looking at how high the object was. Finally, recommendations. Recommendations on how one could improve the experiment. Okay, so you need to state, so for example, if you list your sources of error as being the fact that you had different people measuring the time it took to fall, then obviously a recommendation would be that if you did this experiment again, you would use one person to measure the time it takes for this um, thing to fall. Okay, and all these are very central parts of the scientific investigation. Right, so now let's look at a silly example. It is a silly example, but it is a proper scientific investigation and it has proper scientific investigation of questions. So let's have a look at it. It says Homer notices that his shower is covered in a strange green slime. So let's draw a cubicle that represents Homer's shower. Okay, so it's covered in green slime. His friend Barney tells him to use coconut juice and it will get rid of the green slime. Homer decides to check this out by spraying half of the shower with coconut juice. So half of it gets coconut juice. Okay, half of it. This half gets coconut juice. The other half Okay, he doesn't do anything to spray the other half with half of the shower with water, which happens anyway every time you shower. So that's really your control. Do you agree? Nothing different is happening there. After three days of treatment, there is no change in the appearance of the green slime on either side of the shower. Okay. So it says, what do you think Homer's aim was? Okay, what do you think his aim was? So is he saying that his aim was to remove the strange green slime is not correct. Because if that was the case, then he would have just sprayed the whole of the shower with coconut juice and assumed that it would have worked, okay? That is not his aim. His actual aim is to check whether or not coconut juice actually does remove the green slime. So his aim was basically to check or was to prove whether or not coconut juice actually removed the green slime. What was the control group? Well, I kind of gave it away. This side of the shower, which has been sprayed with water, is the control group. It's the control group. Why? Because nothing has been changed. Whenever you have a shower, your walls are being sprayed with water, okay? So therefore, there's nothing happening there that's different. So that is the control group. What was the independent variable? Okay, so let's think about this. We've got dependent variable and we've got independent variable. The dependent variable is going to be your y-axis and that is what we measure and the independent variable is what we change. Do you remember that? Okay, right, and that's your x-axis. Okay, so your dependent variable is what we measured. And what did we measure? We measured the appearance of the green slime. So in this case, the independent variable is going to be what? So that's the dependent. The dependent is the appearance of the green slime. So what is the independent? The independent is the using of the coconut treatment, the coconut juice. Okay, so the independent variable is the amount of coconut juice added to the shower. And I've just spoken what the dependent variable was. It was the appearance of the green slime. Now it says, what would be a valid hypothesis for Homer's experiment? Now remember, a hypothesis doesn't have to be right. It doesn't have to be wrong. It just has to relate to variables that you are using. So do you agree that we are using coconut juice to remove strange green slime? Right. 
So the valid hypothesis would be that spraying coconut juice will get rid of the green slime. That's one valid hypothesis. Another valid hypothesis would be to say the coconut juice will not get rid of the green slime because we don't know. But both of those statements are valid hypotheses for Homer's experiment. Right, so what I'm going to do is, just to get back to this, is I'm going to go through different sections like momentum, etc, etc, etc. And when we get to a specific section, like if we're looking at rates of reaction or something like that, and or I don't know, equations of motion. And if I come across a very nice question that uses scientific investigation, then I will include that as one of the questions that we go through in that section so that you can get used to practicing and identifying your dependent, your independent variables, your safety gear that you would use, etc., etc. Because the more you become aware of these things, the easier these questions become. Right, and now we've got 15 minutes left. So I'm going to move on to momentum. Okay, so first of all, it's important to realize that momentum is a man-made measurement. What do I mean by that? Well, if I say to you how heavy is something, how heavy is something, you might say, well, it's so many kilograms, and you might go, well, that's a man-made measurement because we have decided how big a kilogram is. True, but if you didn't know about kilograms and I gave you a brick to hold in one hand and a feather to hold in the other, you would be able to tell me very realistically that the brick is much heavier than the feather. And even if we weren't given the values of kilograms, you could in some way tell me how many times bigger or heavier the brick is to the feather, right? What I mean by this being a man-made measurement is that it's a quantity that we've manipulated in science to help us understand something that we noticed. Okay, let me carry on and I'll explain. It's defined as the product of the object's mass and its velocity. So you guys have, I'm sure, even before you live and learn about momentum in physical science, if you see something rolling down a hill, okay, and it rolls faster and faster and faster down the hill, what is the obvious thing that one would say? One would say, oh, it has gained momentum. So momentum is a measure, really, and it's a measure of how things move. And it has been defined as a product of an object's mass and its velocity. So it it is represented by P simply because mass had stolen the M already. So P is equal to mass times velocity. So obviously the units then are very easy. It's probably the easiest units out there. It's kilograms, meters per second. It's the SI unit for mass, which is kilograms, and the SI unit for velocity, which is meters per second. Now, velocity is a vector and mass is a scalar, and a vector times a scalar is always a vector. So that means the momentum is a vector as well, which means it must have direction. And if you see a negative momentum, it usually means, well, 90% of the time, it means that it's in the opposite direction. Right, so let's just look at a very basic example. It's got a thousand kilogram car moves due west. Okay, so it's going west. Oh, it's terrible. Going west at a speed of 17 meters per second. And it says find its momentum. Find its momentum. Okay. So we know that P is equal to MV, and yes, that formula is given to you on the formula sheet. The mass is in SI units, so that's a thousand. The velocity is in meters per second, which is the SI units, so that's 17. So that is just 17,000 kilograms meters per second. And if you leave your answer just like that, you have done something wrong. What? Um, have has she done wrong well you have left out the direction you've left out the direction which is west okay right now the car moves due west now it moves due west at 25 meters per second so it was already moving due west 17 meters per second now it moves due west at 25 meters per second. It says find its change in momentum. So what I've done here is I've typed out 
the equations that we would use when we're finding out the change in momentum. So when you want the change of anything, it's always that final minus the initial. So change of momentum is the final momentum minus the initial momentum. So Wiener momentum is mass times velocity, right? So therefore that is mass times the final velocity minus mass times the initial velocity which then is mass times by the final velocity minus initial velocity. What have I done? I've taken out the common factor of the mass, which is equal to m delta v. So therefore we can say that delta p is equal to m delta v, and that too is on your formula sheet. So now we can work this out, okay? They want the change in momentum. So we know that delta p is equal to m delta v. The mass of the object is a thousand kilograms. It was traveling at 17 meters per second west, but now it's traveling at 25 meters per second west. And because this is a vector, I need to give a direction that is positive, so I'm choosing west as positive. So the final velocity 25 minus the initial velocity of 17, okay, which is going to be 1,000 times by, what is that, 8. So it becomes 8,000 kilograms meters per second. We haven't finished because this too, the change in momentum is a vector. And this is a positive value, which means it must be going in the original direction, which means it's traveling west. Okay, let's move on. Now it says a rabbit ball of mass 0 0.75 kilograms is dropped. Okay, and it strikes the floor with an initial velocity of 3.75 meters per second. It bounces back up with a final velocity of 2.65 meters per second. Calculate the change in the momentum of the rubber ball caused by the floor. Okay, so we've got this little ball and it bounces, swing, and it hits the ground. And then it bounces back up, swing. Okay, right. When it hits the ground over here, it is traveling with a velocity of 3,75 meters per second, okay? When it bounces off the ground, it's traveling at a velocity of 2,65 meters per second. So do you see that it's changed direction? And the fact that it's changed direction is actually the big part of this question. Okay, so we need to choose a direction as positive. So I'm going to choose the original direction as positive. It really doesn't matter which direction you choose. Okay, choosing the direction down as positive. Right, so we've got change in momentum, delta P, is equal to M delta V. Okay, which is equal to M VF minus VI. So this is obviously going to be my VI, and this is obviously my VF. So I am now going to substitute into here. So you've got the mass, which is 0 0.75. The final velocity, now listen, you have to be careful here. This here is going up. So because it's going up, what is its sign in front of it? It is negative. It's minus 2,65 minus the original, which is 3,75. And now we need a calculator. And we need to move it over. Right. So it becomes 0, 0,75 bracket minus 2,65 minus 3,75, close bracket equals, and we don't like that answer, we need to press it down, and it becomes minus 4.8, that's minus 4,8 kilograms meters per second. So it says calculate the change in the momentum of the rubber ball caused by the floor. So you can either leave it like this, but the correct answer would be to say, well, that's a minus. We chose up, I mean, we chose down as positive. So this means that this is up. So the correct answer is 4,8 k 
kilograms meters per second upwards. Okay, and that is a change in momentum of the rubber ball caused by the floor. Okay, right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop now because we're basically out of time. And Newton's second law in terms of momentum is quite an important section, and you guys really need to know it and to understand it. So we will start with that tomorrow. Please, if you didn't understand anything or if you missed anything, please go back and watch the recording. Have a great day.